All right, so we are here today to talk about the possibilities of creative coding. Okay, audio is good. And um, so this is not going to be a very technical, it's not going to be technical at all, actually. Um, so this will be more of an inspiration kind of a presentation so that, um, that you can really follow up on the, on the kind of things that you need to learn in order to join the world of creative coding, which ends up being a, a very mixed kind of knowledge because you can be a bit of a builder, you can be a bit of a electronics kind of guy, and of course you need to know how to program. But we'll, uh, we'll get to that in a second. So, who am I? My name is uh, Luis Ferreira, I'm uh, 32 years old, and I'm, uh, I came from Portugal about eight years ago, and I always lived here in the, the Netherlands, in uh, Eindhoven. Um, about, so when I arrived, I worked for a couple of years at the Technical University of Eindhoven, where I worked a bit with the robotics, user interfaces, and then I decided to move on to, uh, to a more professional, uh, to the professional area, um, where I worked at Noble Technology, and I worked also, a, a again, a, with a bit of robotics, industrial automation, and user interfaces. But actually, when I, when I started to, well, a few times during my, my experience in the robotics uh, department, let's say, I had the chance to often use uh, simulations or use uh, some kind of uh, program to, to view what the robot was actually seeing in the real, wo real world. And this was something that, uh, that got, me, got me quite interested in how do these visualizations work? How far can you push it? How interesting can you make them? And um, that's, that's kind of where it started to, to work a bit, that I got a bit inspired by technology. Later, um, I developed some, uh, some personal projects where the light canvas is the most, um, I'll say the most meaningful and also the, the longest one that took to develop um, and this is uh, also uh, as well with the, as well the, the Flint wearables project. So both of them work a lot with light and color. Although the light canvas, the idea is that you would be able to paint with light without any gimmicks, without any camera tricks. I really wanted to paint with light in the more, the most natural possible way, or the most natural interaction possible way. And that's just basically with a brush and just with a button and maybe soon not even a button, just a painter's palette. But okay, so I developed a few projects and uh, this has been my, my road so far and about two years ago, so not that long ago, I decided to, to really try uh, to, to go into the world of creative technology uh, as a creative technologist and as a creative coder. So, and this presentation is actually basically a, a bit of a, organized way for me to, to show what I learned over the, the last two years. And there's very different, uh, not different, but very subjective information throughout this presentation. Uh, so if you are an experienced creative coder or generative uh, designer, um, yeah, know that we're talking a bit about art. So it's always a bit about interpretation and how you, you see some of these things. But let's, uh, let's start. So. If we're going to talk about creative coding, we need to talk about coding first. I don't know how many of you know what coding is actually, or how it works, but basically coding is a way to instruct a computer to perform a task. And each of these instructions is, is very simple and written in a language that the computer understands. Of course, it's also useful if the person also understands it. But for example, if we talk about binary code, these are just zeros and ones. So for the computer, this is very easy to understand. For the person, it's not easy to understand. So that's why you have different types of languages, some a bit more low level, some a bit more high level, but most of them are written in English. However, the way you structure the, the sentences or the instructions is a bit more, is a bit like that last example where you just say, I want the result and I want this function to take this parameter and this parameter and return a result. Um, we will get a bit more into that uh, a bit further ahead, but the, the most easy analogy that I could think of is, for example, a cooking recipe. On a cooking recipe, you also have simple um, instructions that when accumulated, when, uh, when you do a lot of cutting, when you wait, when you 
turn up the, the, the fire and you turn it down. All of these things are just one action or should be just one action. And at the end of several steps, you have a meal, you have a cake, you have a soup, you have something tasty and complex. So with programming, it's not that different actually. And these are some of the, this is just an example of some of the instructions that I used, that I use on a program uh, that, I, that I'm developing on the living lab. And the idea here, for example, is you have an object and th that object can do things. It, it is, is able to do thing, something. And we call those things functions. So if I say, for example, a shape, which is my object, get vertex. And remember that in a shape for trigonometry or for geometric worlds, a shape has edges and has uh, vertexes. So the vertexes are the corners of the shape. And we can, what you can see in this instruction is just, you can get the, the coordinate from this uh, vertexes and you can play around with this information, subtra subtract it in order to create something more interesting. And since the, I believe that technology is present in almost every aspect of our, uh, of our everyday life, and just for a second, try to think for yourself, what is the, the most unlikely place that you, that you encountered technology? And I also truly believe that once technology gets more and more integrated into our reality, programming is going to be a necessary skill for almost everyone that wants to take control of this technology. So now we have a bit of a bit of an idea what coding or what programming is just giving simple instructions to the computer and after a lot of instructions you get a complex behavior. So what is creative coding? Um, creative coding for me this is a bit of a hard definition but the, the best definition that I found so far is that expression is more important than function. And what I mean with this is that for example when I was working um, as a developer for Nobler Technology in industrial automation projects. Everything that I was doing had to have a function. Otherwise, why was I doing it? Why was someone paying me to, to do it? And this is the, the thing that really was very clear when you stepped into the world of creative coding. You don't do things because you want to produce something faster. You want to be more precise with this or that. No, you just do it because you're curious about what's the result. You are, you want to, to express yourself in a certain way. And the same way as coding is a tool for, for industry, for example, that you can work with. It is also creative coding is a tool for automated and intelligent art. We will go over what these two, these two words mean in a second. But one of the things that, uh, that I noticed during, a, in a couple of presentations that I've done for the light canvas, is that people would ask me, okay, but then uh, what, uh, what, the, what does the light canvas do? And then for a second, this question was always a bit weird for me to answer because it's not supposed to do anything. You're supposed to use it and you're supposed to get some enjoyment, some fun out of it. So it's not about the function, it's about the expression and the interaction. Creative coding is a very big term, let's say it's very, very generalistic, but there are specific subgenres or se several techniques within creative coding. One of them, the most popular, I would say, is generative art or generative design. And according to Wikipedia, again, sorry for the very literal uh, definitions, but like I said, this is a bit of a, a strange, uh, it's difficult to define. So I always try to define the, the most official explanations. And in this case, generative art is art that in a whole or part has been created with the use of an autonomous system. So here we see again the, the word autonomous. Autonomous, think for example, autonomous driving, autonomous cars. These are cars that are able to do decisions, to, to make decisions by themselves and to drive around. In this case, we're talking about the computer as an autonomous system for generative art. So we're talking about a computer that is able to make decisions on what to show on the screen, what to draw in order to create art. And of course, these uh, decisions and this intelligence comes from the algorithms that the, the programmer developed. So 
now we compare it to programming and creative coding, but how does actually creative coding compare to traditional art? And actually, I'm going to take just uh, 10 or 15 seconds to, to ask, is it clear so far? Uh, what I've talked about programming and creative coding, do you have any questions? Okay, I think not. <laughs> so let's go on. How does creative coding compare to traditional art? Okay. <laughs> okay, good, good. I was a. Uh, so the, the more complicated parts of the, the presentation are just about to be over. This will be another one that I really hope that you that you guys and girls understand. But let's move on. In order to compare creative coding with uh, traditional art or traditional media tools, um, I came up with this, uh, with this analogy between a calculator and a computer. So how does a, cal a calculator do its job? It does its job by performing sequential actions or it interacts with you by performing uh, certain sequential actions. What you usually do with a calculator is that first you select the first number, the operation, second number, and the result. This is a very linear way of inputting the data in or actually getting a, getting a result out of the, the calculator. And um, also remember that independent of the operation, the order by which you actually press the buttons, by the order by which you do things, is always the same. So for me, this is a very sequential behavior. How does a computer perform yeah, it's tasks, basically. So one of the most important uh, programming structures, if I can call it like that, is, uh, is what we call an if structure, is a conditional structure. And what this allows you to do is that the computer is able to interpret and analyze um, on the spot something that is happening. So for example, if I just, I can ask questions to the computer and I can have two different actions according to whether, whether the, the question or the, the condition is true or false. So if, for example, if I just say, hey, is it weekend? Um, yeah, or sorry, today is the weekday. So if I was going to, to analyze, if I was going to run the program now, and if I ask it, is it weekend right now? No, then you would have a certain action. However, if you run the same program, on the weekend, the answer is yes. So this gives you kind of a, an, well, not unexpected, but gives you choices and turns the computer into an intelligent, autonomous uh, machine. Uh, so hold on to this uh, definition between a sequential and a conditional action, because now we're going to compare classic media tools, a bit like Photoshop, Blender, even Paint, Windows Paint, Inkscape, these kind of things. And I want to use the same analogy between the calculator and the computer to show you the difference between, or show you what I learned or how I interpret what is the, the, the advantage of creati creative coding over classic media. And in classic media, for example, if you're talking about uh, Photoshopping, just one image, or if you're talking about video editing with Premiere, whatever it is, you always get a bit of a one-sided conversation. Uh, what I mean with that is that you look at the picture, you, you take something out of that picture, but nothing actually changes in the picture. Same thing for the video. You can have a video like this one that is on the slide right now. Do I have an arrow? Mm, yes, I do have an arrow. Yes. So like this, uh, this, pic this video that is here looping, it's just basically repeating, but it will never change its behavior. It will never change what it's, what it's showing over the course of its lifetime. On the other hand, creative coding tools are conditional, like we just saw. And when they, when they become, when you have conditions to something, when you add choices to something, you can also make it interactive because the programmer doesn't need to guess what did you type, uh, what, did, what did you do when you open the application. The application can make decisions based on what you're actually doing. And what this allows you to do 
is that for different input and further ahead we are talking about we will talk about input output and process for different input different starting points for the the program's lifetime let's say you can uh, obtain different output and what this gives you is a bit of an emergent behavior and if you look at the, the animation that i have here on the right side next to the creative coding tools you will see that the, the images on the screen, they are reacting to the person's movements. But these movements are very, very unique to each person. So this is what it means with emergent behavior that the designer did not know that the person would do this or this or this. They just programmed everything so that the program would react, hopefully correctly, to these new positions. So this factor that you can uh, because the computer is is able to make decisions is also able to interact with you it's not a one-way conversation it's two-way so i say something to, to the computer the computer does something back to me um now i'm going to show you so i have uh, here several videos oh and by the way all of these uh, slides that you are seeing now i'm going to share these slides afterwards and if you see that, if you always check, there's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of links that you can click and a lot of videos that you can watch. And that I do encourage you to do that after the presentation is over, because now I need to run a bit. But just for you to have a better idea of what can you do with creative coding, besides my own explanations, let's check this video. Give me one second because something is wrong here. Oh yeah, I know what is wrong. My bad. Uh, of course, something had to be wrong. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But so. All right. Any questions so far? By the way, you're going to see the, the examples that you very quickly saw in this very uh, intense video. Uh, I will show you some more examples later on that, that I will explain more wha about what is going on. You still have two other videos in this slide. Yeah, You have two other videos in this slide that I also advise you to, to watch, but since they are a bit longer and more slow, boring, you can uh, do it on your own time because soon I will start to show some uh, uh, some examples. So, Hopper Schreck is asking: Is C++ a language of programmer? Uh, what Pro is a language of programming? Yes. So C++ is actually one of the most popular programming languages because it is so powerful and it can perform so well. And when I say perform, for example, compared to Java or JavaScript, uh, especially JavaScript is becoming very popular right now. Uh, Python is also another language that is very popular, but C++ compared to Java and Python, C++ is more, can perform better. You get more speed of whatever you're actually trying to do. Um, but to be honest, it's not going to, when you're starting, you're not going to make huge projects that are going to take advantage of all the capabilities of the language. When you're starting, you're just going to explore, you're going to have some simple scenes. So I would say to not worry so much in the beginning which lang or not worry so much about the performance of the language that you're going to pick, but worry more how easy it is to, to write something for with that language. Marina Provatiru is asking, which development platform do you use? Is it Unity also? Visual Studio or some other platform? So I started with uh, processing. I did not really make a, jo a jump into P5.js, which is JavaScript. By the way, I'm also going to show you a list of um, programs and languages that you can choose from with links and a couple of tutorials. But to answer to Mar uh, Marina, I use mostly processing. I had a couple of months that I was really trying to get into Touch Designer, which is an awesome, really, really awesome, both for the developer and for the person interacting with the, with the work, uh, because the development environment is very, very interesting in Touch Designer. Uh, and I also tried Unity 3D uh, more recently and I was also pleasantly surprised 
Um, in the end, I kind of had to make the choice, am I going forward with Touch Designer or with Unity 3D? Because it takes a while to, to master these, uh, these languages and these programs. So you want to choose something a bit more for the long term. So I chose Unity, so I really plan to, to put a lot more effort into Unity. But right now, my main programming language is Processing, or Programming Framework is Processing, which is based on Java. And by the way, Visual Studio is, a, is an editor. So Visual Studio is a program, uh, but it doesn't really allow you to do anything directly with it, if I can say it like that. You can edit text, a bit like Notepad or a bit like Sublime. You can edit code that you can then run uh, in another way. But Visual Studio itself can be used for many different things, not specifically for creative coding. But of course, you can use it with some other platforms. Okay, so let's, uh, let's move on. And now I want to talk to you about the digital creative process. And before, you probably saw um, some, some, uh, some words that involved input and output. And coming from the engineering, the concept of a black box is exactly this, where you have an input, you have a black box that you don't know what is inside, you don't know what is happening inside. You just know that the input goes in the box and it comes out as output transformed into something else. Oh, <laughs> okay, Lucas, I'll see you, see you around. That was for a chat, sorry. So the creative process, I created, a, I tried to, to create an example that, that uh, shows what is actually the, the biggest uh, advantage and power of creative coding over traditional art. So let's see if I can uh, explain this properly. So in traditional art, just imagine that you just want to, to draw something and your creative process is going to be lines. I want to use lines to draw something. So what you start with, for example, uh, uh, you start with some kind of inspiration. You need to know where you're going to put the pencil and where is that pencil going to end up so you can draw a line. So I'm calling this as an inspiration just for it, just for uh, um, to give you an idea what I mean. Then what you do with this inspiration, you draw one line, you draw a second line, you draw a third line, and your artwork is complete as a, as a traditional artist, let's say. With generative art, the approach, you also have a creative process. My creative process, let's say, is still to use lines to do some kind of drawing. But what happens next is the, where creative coding really shines and really um, becomes a useful tool. So what happens in the beginning of the program, and like I said, if you want to draw a line, maybe by hand, you can just put the pencil on the, on the paper and just free hand, just move your hand freely without actually knowing where your hand will end up. But with a computer, this is not the case. With a computer, you need to give it a start and an end point. And actually, this is one of the, the biggest differences. Um, I also like to sketch and a bit to paint. And one of the biggest differences is that that I noticed with creative coding, although it's expressive, although it's art, you cannot just freehand something. You cannot um, improvise, I'd say. At least I'm not so, so good at that part. Maybe, maybe some other programmers are. But I mean, what I mean with improvising is that I need to know what is going to happen before it happens. If I don't, I cannot program it. If I cannot program it, then the, the, the program doesn't exist. So. With generative art, you still have a creative process, which in, is in this case to use lines. Um, but at the beginning of the program, you're going to read the data. And this data can be just random points on the screen or can be, for example, data sets where you have several coordinates and you want to do a line between each pair of coordinates. So you do this once, you read the data and you have the, the points are A, B, C, D, E, and F. Um, and then you're going to draw a line between every every pair of points. However, when you start the program again, when you press the button or you went double click the program again, if you give it different data, like you see here, now you still have the same set of six points, but now their values are different. With the same creative process, you obtain a different kind of art. Um, and this difference is going to be very tightly connected to your creative process. So how, how random can, you, can your program be, your, your piece of art? Um, 
so just to just to just to reiterate and just to clarify every time you double click on the program every time you start the program if the, the initial data is different your creative process is the same your result will be different so and this is literally just a double click and every time you get a new uh, a new piece of art maybe this will be a bit more clear ahead but i i hope you understand this um, automation part so actually here is where the automation the automated uh, machine really uh, shows so now let's really talk about let's focus for a second on the creative process uh, and for creative coding like i said i like to use the the kind of a black box uh, kind of um, explanation for what is happening as well as one of the the artists that i'm going to show next actually i'm going to use as an example for here for this part so you have an input that input those coordinates for the lines for example or the color that you're going to use for the brush whatever it is this is your input and this color can be random this color can also come from da a data set for example but the the way you, how you interact with the program how you give it something can also be with the mouse with the keyboard those are actually the most common ways to provide some information to the program that that the program can then play around with uh, and finally also let's not forget about sensors because if we're talking about uh, physical computing which we will see what actually means later sensors are very a very interesting way to bring reality into your program so a sensor can be a camera just like this one and what this allows you to do is that in the digital world everything is very blocky everything is a matrix everything is square um, and when you actually bring in sensors whether it's a microphone whether it's a camera a light sensor many different kinds of sensors what you get is a behavior that is not sharp square but is more wavy more natural you know well that's actually the best word natural so break <laughs> So you have an input your process needs some kind of information and your process your creative process in this case is your algorithm now you have an input for your algorithm and uh, you're going to start developing your creative process by writing down instructions and these instructions what they are going to do basically they are going to transform the input into some kind of output which we see now and one of the the very very uh, well important and uh, the one of the most amazing things i've seen about creative coding is that no matter how you start you can start with a keyboard click you can start with a mouse movement you can start with sensor data what you end up with can be a projection can be a 3d print can be music we will get to that a bit more ahead uh, can be a regular print that you can see on the streets or as flyers but can also be the movement of motors so that way you already got the information from the real world real world and now you want to interact with the real world you have, you want to have something that pushes another object a motor can do this kind of thing so it can interact with physical stuff in your world and a few a few important things to keep in mind is that different input provides different starting points and also therefore it changes how what kind of output you're going to get and i give here a, i have here a link to, to the black box model that you can uh, read on later um so is there any question about this part specifically next uh, we're going to go a bit about uh, we're going to go over examples so is the creative process is the algorithm clear what it does what uh, what is its uh, purpose I guess so so there's still a bit of a I think 30 second delay between the chat so just post your questions and I will answer them when I when I get them um, now let's see an actual example of what is uh, what this power from transforming an input into an output with a creative process let's see what you can actually do with it 
And Patrick Kuchner is, a, is an artist based in uh, Berlin, I believe, or at least in Germany. And what he did in this project called, um, whoops, uh, let's see here, yeah. So let's start this again. What Patrick did in this project, he took um, dancers' movements, like really someone dancing and probably with some body tracking that you can uh, now do uh, quite easy. So he took the movement of the dancers in order to create a poster, a video, an interactive program. So these are three different kinds of outputs, all from the same input. And of course, notice that the, what you see here on the, on the video is that it's not just the dancer standing in the middle of the poster, let's say, and dancing. That doesn't make the poster. Patrick's creative process in this case was to overlap each frame of the animation into the same position or even make the, 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 the dancer move around a bit and then overlap the, the result of each frame. And what you get from that is something that looks quite interesting, a bit like this. So, I mean, this is a real good looking poster from a professional designer. And the other important thing, if we go back to, I oh know we actually are not going back to the PowerPoint. We're actually going to use this. The other important thing besides being able to create different kinds of output for your program uh, yeah, is that, like I said, every time you run the program, you will get a different result. You will get a different visual. But because you still use the same creative process, the same algorithm, the same instructions, and the only thing that's changing is the input data, you get a similar, you get a recognizable uh, result. So for example, here in these three, uh, these three images that you're seeing now, all of them are very recognizable uh, coming from the same source. At least, it to me, it feels that way. Every red dancer that you're going to see all over this page feels like it came from the same place. And that is a very important thing when you're talking about branding and we're talking about this kind of commercial projects is that you want to have unique posters, but you want every poster, poster to be recognizable and to be associated with a certain brand or a product or a person. And this is one of the biggest advantages of creative coding compared to traditional uh, media tools like, like the ones I talked about before. You get unique, almost infinite outcomes for the same thing. Recognizable as well. So let's just go over, I wanted to add a bit of uh, history, but uh, I'm talking a bit too much. So we are going a bit over fast about this part. So how did uh, creative coding develop? How did it come to, to, to be what it is today, to grow the same way that it did? Um, so the first thing, we need more powerful computers because to generate some of the images, some of the videos that we used to see 20 years ago, you would need hours to, to generate every frame or at least to generate one simple movie, it would take hours. Nowadays, you can do the same thing 60 frames per second. This is considered real time when you have a video uh, that, uh, that, that, that has 60 FPS, FPS, which allows you to do more complex, uh, more complex scenes. And this evolution of the processing power is connected to the Moore's law uh, which you can uh, check out if you're curious what it is. But also the evolution of port portable uh, devices. Um, but also the, the evolution of portable devices like the laptop, smartphone, and also wearables uh, allowed us to, to spend a lot more time looking at a screen and a pretty app or a pretty and interactive, interactive app gets more attention. I think we all agree with that. But also the, the quality of the, the projectors or the beamers, depending on however you want to call it, the quality has been really going up, but it also, you have now other options for, for kind of beamers and holog holographic experiences, some of, the, some of which I'm going to show later. But this movement from a 2D screen, that is really just 2D, no matter what you're seeing, you can be looking at a 3D image, but in the end it's still 2D when it comes to the screen. However, when you project on top of a surface that is not flat, or when you use this kind of holographic techniques, you go further than 2D. And also, of course, with the virtual, augmented, and mixed realities, 
this is another kind of 3D and further that I called here further. And last but not least, one uh, very important thing that is actually right now coming up, uh, so it's not there yet, is the use of artificial, artificial intelligence for creative coding, for creating art instead of uh, creating something that performs better. And in this, um, for this part, I have here a link, a talk from Rick Parraza, is a uh, creative project leader or something like a creative project leader at Microsoft. And this video um, was really uh, interesting for me to watch, to, tell, to learn about the technological development of creative coding. But also what kind of you, so it also grew because it's a very powerful tool for education it's a very powerful, powerful tool for art, like, uh, well, we could, yeah. So it's a very powerful tool for uh, art, like we are now finding out. But like I said in the beginning, coming from the, the robotics background and seeing so many of these simulations um, of how the computer, how the robot sees and interprets the world, I found them often, well, some of them could be a lot better looking, but some of them were already looking amazing and they didn't really have a, they had a purpose just to inform you. They're, they were not supposed to be good looking or pretty, but they were. So this kind of mix of creative coding or expression and engineering, I also find it very interesting. And of course, sensors. And I'm a big fan of um, natural interaction. So interacting with the computer without having to press a key on the keyboard or without using the mouse. So using your hands, using your body, uh, through body tracking, using our facial expressions um, for, that you can get from, a, from a, a camera, for example. So all of these things really opened up new possibilities in the world of creative coding. Now, just a comment for Lauhi saying that AI isn't there yet. Well, AI, people are starting to, to now understand a bit more what you can do with AI and develop um, algorithms that perform a lot better than, the, than they used to do before but it is not there yet in the sense that um, so what i mean in this previous slide is that when i say ease of use so ai is becoming easier to use for people that don't have a full knowledge about it and you have programs like runway ml so runway ml that already make the, the use of ai for creative coding a lot easier and this is an essential step for almost anyone to actually use ai in their projects Otherwise, you have to set up a very complex uh, sequence of algorithms that kind of feed each other um, in order to have one of these AI agents. And AI is artificial intelligence, um, just to be clear on that. So another small break. If you have any questions, please let me know. So, like I was saying in the, the beginning, creative coding is a very general term, a very uh, broad way to define something. And inside of uh, creative coding, you have, uh, well, flavors, subgenres. No. Um, so we have some kind of subgenres uh, of creative coding, and that's what we are going to go through now. Um, and actually, now this is going to be the, the more interesting part of the, the presentation, if I can say it like that. So, creative coding as a whole, what do you have inside of creative coding? Generative art is arguably one of the most popular techniques, flavors, whatever you want to call it, of creative coding. And within generative art, it can have certain features that are very important to what it actually does. So, being real-time, meaning that you can actually calculate everything that you need, well, the, the, the normal... Um, what do you call it? The normal rule is that you can only call your program real time if it does at least 30 frames per second, or if it feels fluid, if it doesn't feel like, um, how do you call it, stuck, if it doesn't feel like it's getting stuck every time. So if it's fluid uh, and something within 30 frames or 60 frames per second, you can call it real time. But it can also be interactive, like we saw in the beginning that the movements of someone else, that person that was standing in front of the screen and the shape was reflecting the pose of the person, that is interactivity. 
different people will have different experiences. Immersive is when something gets a bit more into your own reality, let's say. Well, maybe not your own reality, so you can have immersive when something digital comes into the physical world, or you can have also immersive when you jump into the digital world, for example, with some immersive gaming, immersive um, uh, uh, virtual reality. And audio reactive, so it reacts to sound, or it can also generate sound, and data-driven. Um, in the beginning, we talked about how you need an input for your creative process. Otherwise, nothing changes and you might as well do it by hand. So data-driven uh, means that you use real data, data sets, uh, to actually make your program work. And what this means is, for example, you can use the wind speed over the course of one month in a certain region of the planet. So then you collect all of these wind readings or the temperature readings, whatever you want to call it, whatever you want, you, you want to use, and you make a data set. You make a whole package of data that you can then use in your own program. Um, AI, yeah, like I said in the beginning, so it's very, very promising and it's, it's getting somewhere interesting, but I think it's going to be even more interesting in the future. Physical computing, I really like, like this one because I always found it very limiting to leave my work in a screen where my screen only lives in something that is 2D and I do like to interact with the computer, I do like to, to play with technology not necessarily giving technology the how do you say it? the most important place, the most visibility technology is a tool, is a vehicle it's not the final goal so I want to create experiences with technology and Technology will be a vehicle, will be a tool, and I really like to focus on physical computing because then I can really interact with the computer using sensors and I can make the computer interact with the world using motors, for example. And one, uh, one interesting example of this is pen plotters, which we will see some examples ahead. AV performances, audiovisual performances. So these are performances a bit like shows, concerts, uh, live, live shows. However, in some of these light shows, you, you still have the, um, the artist, the, um, the dancer, whatever, you, whatever you're watching. Um, I lost my train of thought. Oh yeah, so you have more kind of the, the visuals, the light, the, the projections going on behind the artists, and you have the artist on stage. Usually this kind of thing, these two are disconnected a bit, or at least the, the visuals are a support act to the artist, so the artist is the main act. Without the visual performances, the connection between what you're seeing and what you're hearing is much more coupled, is much more tight. So for example, sometimes the, the sounds might generate visuals, or it could be that the visuals are generating sounds. So the connection between, between the visual and auditory components in AV performances is very, very big, much bigger than in concerts, for example. And finally, light art, and um, well, this is not an official, uh, I would say, subgenre, but I try to, to include projection mapping, uh, holographic projections, and even the use of LEDs within this kind of uh, category. So, we're done with the, the boring technical part of the presentation. Now let's look at some, uh, some cool examples. Um, so Lau is asking if I work for a company that has this kind of projects. Well, no, that's why I quit my company and that's why I'm trying now to become a, a full-time uh, worker, having my own company doing this kind of projects and workshops, by the way. Um, so it's not as easy or as, so these kind of things with creative coding is not as popular as it will be in the future. So it's still not so easy to find employers or find someone that, that wants some kind of work like this. Uh, Robert Hick is asking, is the, art, is the artist you are taking as an example also the creative of the algorithms? Um, which example are we talking about? Sorry, there's some, uh, some mismatch. Uh, but <coughs> yeah, so if you're an artist working with creative coding, you are a coder. 
you are a programmer, that therefore you are developing the algorithm yourself. However, you can always pair with a pair up or a, a match with, a, with other people. So you can work in a team where you have a bit of a technological knowledge, but you don't understand the whole thing, but you have some support from someone that is a bit more technical and less artistic. So in the end, the people that you will find within um, creative coding are somewhere in the spectrum between artist and coder. I was going to say engineer, but not necessarily engineer. So between artist and coder, there's a whole place where you can be. Uh, for the live show. So for the live show, yeah, oh, I think I know what you were asking. So with the live shows, with the AV performances, sometimes you have just one person. And like I said, the audio could be creating images or the images could be creating audio. Therefore, the, the, the person, this one person, only has to focus on one part. Or you can have duos, you can have teams, like two, three people doing a single show where one of them is working on the lights, the other one is working on the projection, and the other one is working on the audio. So this can be a bit of a team work. I think that answered your question, or I, I hope so. Whew, uh, we have to speed this up a bit. So we're going to take the, some uh, look at an example of generative art. And the thing I found, uh, find important about generative art, and if you look at this example from uh, the dot is black, is that you see that it is still having that kind of a uh, repeated feeling, that kind of looped feeling. Uh, but that's just because it, you had to, the, the, the artist chose to show this as a video instead of a, as an interactive example. But what I find important about this example is that you see how the animation repeats, so it kind of goes in and out with your breath, and the artist created this animation using some kind of parameters, some kind of input data, uh, or several types of input data. In this case, just the breath, so it could be just like your, the wind speed of your mouth. But the, the visualizations that you see only make sense for a certain range of that input data. And in this case, we're working on breath. So you can see that, that uh, more purple and the more pink, the artist needed to tune the parameters in the program to get this kind of, uh, this kind of image. Um, and this kind of describes the, the, this idea of generative art, art that is generated based on something or even generated on the spot. Although I will not, I will ask you to not get too attached to this explanation of what is generative art or generative design, because there has been one of the most complicated things to, for me to find on the internet, like a good explanation of generative art is very uh, subjective. I have several examples that I will uh, invite you to, to watch later when, uh, when you're watching this, uh, when you download this PDF, because I need to speed up. I've been talking too much. So now we're going to get a bit into physical computing and pen plotters. And what you're seeing here is that you have a machine that is doing the drawing for the person, although the machine does not have imagination to do a drawing by itself. So actually this drawing needed to be coded or programmed by the artist. And the very interesting thing, I mean, you could just simply print the, the final image in a, in a printer, but when you use pen plotters, what you also get is that, so we talked about emergent behavior before. When you make your program interactive and you don't really limit the kind of data that, that your program can read, you can get emergent behavior, you can have unexpected behavior. And when you're working with pens, with pencils, with brushes, um, these are unique tools, these have character, because if you see here on the second example, now you see my mouse, see how this bottom curve is a bit jagged. Here is also a bit jagged, and all of these things um, give you texture. So this is the big advantage of using an actual pen, but still a machine to do your drawing, instead of using a printer to, to show your drawing. And also you can have something much more complicated or too complicated for, for a person to be able to actually do this. In the last example, there's just way too many lines, very specific lines, this would be too hard for a person to do by itself, by, by him or herself. However, if you understand the process, if you can program it, if you can create an algorithm out of, out of it, you can create an output. 
data visualization. And uh, in this case, this works a lot with the data sets and we're talking about, oh, let me just take a step back. Over the last, well, decades of the, the internet, uh, we have been creating a lot of information. So the, the web went from just pages that someone created that you would go there and read what was on that page to something where you contribute to what is happening on the internet. Social networks are a big example of this where the content of Facebook, the content of Instagram is not created by the, by the makers, it's created by you. So you are providing this information, you are creating data. And now we're just talking about social networks, but we can also be talking about sensors that are collecting data every day. And this, uh, this is, for example, the inspiration for the project uh, Living Lab Stratum Zine that I'm working on. But all of this data has been collected and now with creative coding, you can start to do data visualization because just having data collected, just hoarding stuff when you are a hoarder. If you just have stuff around your house, it's still not useful until you find a use for it. With data visualization, it, you can get, you can extract information out of this, uh, out of these piles of data that otherwise don't really have a purpose. Um, and here I have several examples, one from the Washington Post, and actually I just want to, I'm just going to open this one. Uh, let's see how my internet is doing. It's a bit slow. But I'm opening this uh, Washington Post example because through some uh, creative coding, the Washington Post, one of the most important sources of news on the planet, um, was really able to, to give you, a, or should I say it, a feeling of what is happening or what was happening in March 14 when, uh, when the quarantines started to be implemented. What did this actually mean or what would happen? For example, this very simple animation of a ball um, coming in contact with the other one and changing color. This animation doesn't provide information, like very useful information, but it does provide you a feeling of how proximity plays a role within this uh, corona thing. And for example, here is another simulation of how you can see what happens when there's no social distancing, what happens when there's no divisions, when people are just running around, people are going to get infected. So this kind of simulation, they are expressive. They really kind of shock you in a way to make you understand, although they don't really, I mean, it doesn't matter how many people recovered, how many are sick. These actual numbers don't matter so much as the meaning that they are trying to convey. So let's go back to data visualization. So again, there are several examples here. Nadi Bremer is someone that is very, very good at uh, what, what she does what, in this uh, area of data visualization. So I do encourage you to visit her website and understand a bit more what data visualization is. Now we come to, oh, this even has sound. Uh, now we come to the example of an interactive work and for someone that likes to draw li like I do the ability to draw something and have it, have it instantly going into the computer and creating some kind of uh, behavior with, with the help of the computer in this case of a projection is something that I found an awesome example to, to show you um, but it's not the only one so if you look at this one I don't know if you can see that there's a hand on the bottom on the bottom corner the artist is controlling what it looks like to be like a, a bit of a magnifying glass a bit of a, a a source of light that goes in through an MRI scan so a scan of your brain and allows you to see the inside of your brain according to how you move your hand so again another example of interactivity projection mapping so this one I'm not going to to, to skip and actually I'm going to Stop talking for a second and just let you enjoy this example of a projection mapping. And sometimes we are used to seeing projection mapping on buildings. Here in Eindhoven, there's an event called Glow Eindhoven, where that is the, one of the biggest attractions, is building projection mapping. However, you can also do the same with a body.
So I found this example of projection mapping very interesting because without the ability to do body tracking, the projection and the movements of the dancer would have to be 100% coordinated in order for this to look good. And uh, no, we know that doesn't happen. Having a 100% coordinated movement between a fixed point and a moving dancer, that's not going to happen unless you have body tracking. And in this case, uh, we talked about body tracking. Yeah. So we talked about body tracking uh, before as one of the natural ways to interact with the computer. Um, if the computer was not able to see where the dancer was, the animations would never be so perfectly mapped on her own body. Uh, so I found this, this, this example very uh, interesting. And like I mentioned before, this is a, I'm just going to show a bit of this one. This is the, what I told you about Glow Eindhoven. So Glow Eindhoven is, a, is an event that happens every year. Well, not this year actually. And this was an example from last year that was a really cool projection mapping on a building. <laughs> I forgot to turn on the mic. So while this is running in the, the background, I'm going to answer Midas' question, which is, yeah, <laughs> what is the difference between projection mapping and light art? Um, so like I said in the beginning, you can really mix different kinds of techniques. And in this case, you can do mapping, the, the, the technique of mapping something like a building or a body has nothing to do with a projection. Uh, but if you do projection mapping, then it becomes a, project a projection on top of something that you already know what the shape is. Um, so, yeah, projection is a, an example of what I would say is light art. Mapping is not. But in the end, you can combine them. So, let's move on. Let's move on. Oh, this one. So, physical computing, like I said, is something that I really, really enjoy. And in this example, um, Jason Cook created, let me just close some of these things. Oh, sorry. I meant, now we're going to talk about physical computing. And in this example, Jason Cook created something that you can paint, create light with a brush and water. So we're talking about electricity, light and water these things usually don't mix. My internet is not collaborating, um, but I want you to see the result, yeah. So if you go to this to the link that is on the on the presentation, you will be able to see uh, an explanation of how this is done. But come on, you have a water sponge and you can do a light graffiti with a spray and everything. For me, that there's this is a very very cool example of physical computing. Understand that there is not a single keyboard, not a single mouse, uh, not a single button within all of this experience. There's only objects. That's why it's physical. But 
let's move on and I cannot really skip this one because yeah it's my my own project um, and again here I add a question okay my internet is a bit slow here I had a question how can I paint with light uh, and again so in this, uh, in this example in this example there's no keyboard there's no mouse there's one single button and there's a brush and that's how you interact with this project where you can paint with light and again I'm, I'm really not a big fan of make it till you make it as gimmicks I really as an engineer that's what they have so nothing of this is fake what you're seeing is how it actually works Again, you can uh, can find out more later uh, by following the the links that I'm uh, that I'm providing. And just to give a quick answer to Govert Hake, uh, is the building measured or scanned before the performance? Uh, yeah, so that's that's the disadvantage of doing. Uh, well, I'm not going to say yes 100% of the time. Yes, you can do um, the mapping of the building according to the the physical plan to the to the plant or the the architecture's drawing, um, but with new advances in the sensors and in cameras, I'm guessing there's also a way for you to just point the, the uh, a good quality camera at the building and by giving it a sense of scale or by giving it some information on the scale, you should be able to actually scan the, the building from the outside using a camera or a 3D camera. Either way, it's, it's a very complicated uh, thing to do, projection mapping. So let's move on to the immersive examples and here I'm only going to show one and I'm going to show this one because I found it really interesting. Um, here. So this is a huge clock that is placed in the middle of, uh, you can read here what it is. So this is a huge clock in, a, in the middle of a train station. And, okay, I want to make it full screen, but I cannot make it full screen for some reason. Well, then you just have to watch it like this. So notice how, so it is, in this case, it is immersive because that digital element, that digital, digital reality is coming into the physical space in a very, very big way. If you, if you can uh, realize the size of this installation. And what I found very, very interesting when you see when the camera zoom out, zooms out is the use of the negative space to actually show the time. So if you're actually close to it, close to the installation, you get a different type of experience. And then when the, the clock hits, you get a nice animation. But you get a different experience by standing close to the clock, then you can barely tell the time, you can only tell the seconds. But if you step away and you move a bit further back, you start to be able to see um, the actual time within the negative space. And this is also an example of generative art. So it's generative and immersive at the same time. And Stig Hansen is saying that LiDAR will make 3D mapping a breeze. Yes, that is already a fact, that is already true. What is also true is that LiDARs are so expensive, like insanely a good LiDAR is insanely expensive holographic so I'm just going to go through kind of quick on this once um, so Tundra well sorry again coming back to the PowerPoint this uh, project from Tundra I would really encourage you to watch because it uses a new type of uh, so when I was saying how did creative coding grow it grew also with uh, with the rise of some kind of um, um, uh, we're seeing kind of new developments in terms of projection technology and the uh, row uses one kind of special projector that that i encourage you to to visit and then to try to find out in the meantime i'm just going to show you something still holographic but holographic and interactive in a where's the video back there
So what are you seeing here exactly? This is just a beamer, a normal beamer, a normal projector, projecting on top of water particles, very tiny water particles uh, that are coming from the, from the ceiling. What you get actually is a bit of a, a depth kind of feeling to what you're seeing. In the end, this is still 2D. So it's, this is not a real hologram. This is not a 3D hologram. Those things are not possible yet, as far as I know. But this is, let's say, a two and a half D, two and a half dimensions, because you do have X and Y, you have two dimensions. And then you have a bit of a depth, although nothing changes within the depth. What I want you to see is this kind of interaction with it. This kind of feeling of being able to control light in the middle of the air, control an ethere ethereal, well, something you cannot touch, in the middle of the air is something that I really enjoy uh, within projections, within interactivity. Again, something for you to quickly explore further on. Um, now, uh, audiovisual performances, so the, the AV performances that I mentioned in the beginning. Um, these are very two very different kind of, uh, of uh, examples for this kind of thing, where in this one, Tensia, um, just for me to, to speed up a bit, well, I'm just going to talk a bit about it. Where is this? Yeah, this is what I want. So in Tensia, what is happening is that let me pull it a bit ahead. You have a line, you have a rope here, and this person is going to be doing exercise on top of that rope. But what makes it um, an audiovisual experiment or an audiovisual performance is that the graphics and the audio are both connected to the tension in that rope. So the visual and the audio component, and even the, the dancer component, becomes very clear or becomes very interesting. I don't know if this is fake, if, if, if this is coordinated, if the, the pressure on the rope has been practiced by the dancer, or if it's being read in real time, but it really feels like it's being interpreted in real time. Every slight movement that the dancer does has a reaction on the backside. interesting examples if you ask me uh, I'm not going to go over this video now now if we come back to the PowerPoint because this is 12 minutes long but have you heard of an uh, algal rave do you know what the algal rave is so I only learned this last year actually and an algal rave is what you get when you mix algorithms and a rave Turn this off. Um, so this is a kind of a new kind of party where you have yeah, music makers who are also programmers, but they do the music on the spot. So it, it's like a real musician playing an instrument in front of you, but now they create a whole party, a whole scenario. It's just like a electronic music party, but with coders instead of DJs. These are the artists who are unraveling electronic music and recreating it from scratch. live coding thing is about using the computer as a performance tool and showing what you're doing. I like knowing how it was made. I like going, okay, what's the computer doing? Sure, I press play, but what's happening underneath the hood? And there's always that uh, element of what if something goes wrong? And then what if something So I think the, the streaming went down for a couple of seconds. Uh, <laughs> yes, so Govert Schaeg says, yeah, you don't have to use LST. No, so what you get with a lot of these um, experiences that creative coding provides you 
something very trippy, I would say, as almost as good, I guess. Never tried. Anyway, let's move on. Uh, Mayra, uh, you're saying that you cannot hear me, but um, nothing changed on my side, so I hope that you can hear me now. Uh, so now just to kind of, uh, we're getting close to the end, so now we have a bit more audio reactive and audio generative. And in this case, this is audio reactive. The visuals are reacting to the song. how some of the higher frequencies only trigger this part of the drawing and some of the lower frequencies trigger the more the left side of the drawing. So here you're using the whole spectrum of sound as data, as input to your creative process. This on the other hand is a very unique project so we are not creating visuals based on the sound, you're creating sound based on the visual. So you get a feeling of how this, uh, how far this works. Let me just get this so you get a feeling of how, what is happening here. And also a very important thing, whenever you're generating audio with a computer, it is a very complicated thing. I haven't really got that much deep into it. What I know is that most of the times it sounds bad. To be honest, I, it sounds really bad. This is one of the few examples that I found so far online where you have audio generation that actually sounds pleasant, a bit like bird noises. But of course it's also a matter of taste. So one of the comments that I heard once is that, um, yeah, audio, so you have your own standards of beauty as a person, as a, as a human, and when you have another human doing art, no matter it's painting, no matter if it's audio, you both have the same standards, you both have an, uh, have an idea of what sounds good, what looks good, what sounds bad, what looks bad. However, when you let a computer to create audio in a very random way, it sounds weird, it doesn't really have a connection. But then I saw someone asking once, okay, it doesn't sound good to you, but it sounds good to the computer. And I really could not say the person was wrong. So. It's just different definitions of beauty, let's say, when it comes to, to audio, audio generative work. So I think, I believe this is the last one. And with artificial intelligence, what you can see here from this, this example of uh, Lulu X6, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, is an example of style. <laughs> transfer I hope you can hear me better now is something that is very unique to AI because of the way AI comes up to conclusions so whenever you're programming whenever you're creating simple instructions you also need simple events however when you use style transfer uh, with AI what you're actually asking the AI, AI to do is to take one image one one painter, so, okay, let me, let me restart this for a bit. In order to have an AI, an artificial intelligence algorithm working, you need to train it. And in order to train it, you need to give it several, several, several thousands, millions, if you want, of examples. So what you can do with style transfer is that you can ask an AI to learn what is the style, if you, for example, let's say that you give the AI only paintings from a certain artist. Um, what the AI is going to do is the AI is going to understand what is this artist's style. If you, ask it, if you ask three different artists to draw the same thing, you will get three different styles. And what AI allows you to do is to kind of overlap or put these styles on top of another picture or on top of another video while keeping most of its properties like what is a person, what is the sky, what is a wall, all of these things AI is able to, 
to maintain and to exchange in a very intelligent way that we can simply not do with normal programming. Oh, another one that I'm also happy that I saw once, but I'm, then I uh, um, invite you to watch later, is this example of uh, AI use not to generate image or audio, but to try to understand uh, what are the expressions of the musicians. How old are the musicians? So all of this calculating or coming up with information only based on the face of someone. Um, okay, so let's try to wrap this, uh, this long talk, actually. <laughs> let's try to wrap it up a bit. Does creative coding, or if you want to ask questions, now is also a good time while I continue. Does creative coding have a value or is it just a hobby thing? For me, this, this question is, can, has to be answered in two ways. Does it have an intrinsic value, an expressive value? Does it have value as art? And does it have value as something commercial? And uh, here in the, does it have value as art? I'm just going to read this, this piece of text that really inspired me uh, when I was still learning what creative coding was, what generative design was. One overly simple but useful definition is that generative art is art programmed using a computer that intentionally introduces randomness as part of the creation process. So the process that we saw before. And uh, in this case, the, 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 the Jason Bailey is talking about randomness, but what he's talking about is the input. In this case, just focus on randomness, random numbers. You know what random is, I guess, yeah. This often brings up two common but misguided view, viewpoints that hold people back from appreciating the beauty and nuance of generative articles. Um, sorry. Uh, this often brings up two common but misguided viewpoints that hold people back from appreciating the beauty and nuance of generative art. Myth one, the artist has complete control and the code is always executed as written. Therefore, generative art lacks the elegance and the chance of accident, discovery, spontaneity that often makes art great, if not at least human and approachable. So now we're talking about the quality of art um, that is beautiful for the accidents, for, for the uniqueness. For example, let's go back to the example of pen plotters and how the pen had that element of chance. Sometimes you see it, sometimes you doesn't, sometimes you don't. So it's a bit of a rough, it's a bit of a chance. That's what this myth one is talking about. Where the computer is doing all of the work, is taking all of the, is making all of the decisions, and the artist is doing nothing, basically. Myth two, the artist has zero control and the autonomous machine is la randomly generating the designs. Sorry, actually I, I mixed up. The computer is making the art and the human deserves no credit at it as it is not really art. Sorry, I mixed up. So this second myth is when the computer takes all the credit and the first myth is um, that the, the, the programmer has a knowledge or knows 100% what is going to happen. So actually, none of these are correct because the truth, the truth is that generative artists skillfully control both the magnitude and the locations of randomness introduced into the artwork. So whenever you see something that is a bit random, that is a bit strange, there's a big chance that the artist programmed it that way. So all of that is expected purposeful behavior. So there is a balance between, um, I mean, actually when I, when I think about this value of creative coding, uh, is it art? For me, this is the same question as asking, is a DJ a musician? Just because a DJ plays with electronic instruments instead of the, the real thing, that person, he or she, still has to know, yeah, still has to be creative, still has to know how to mix the notes, how to mix the melodies. So in this case, I really see a parallel between a DJ as a music producer and a programmer as an artist. Professional value. So as we talked about before in marketing and branding, the, the example that I gave above from uh, Patrick Huebner uh, when we were talking about the process, um, creative, to creative coding has a lot of uh, interesting purposes for marketing and branding because you can 
with a single program, you can have endless content generation that is always unique and always recognizable. So this is very important when it comes to branding and when it comes to marketing. However, we also talked about AV performances, algo rates, light shows like Glow here in Eindhoven, and even specialized art galleries uh, that allow creative coding to be something very useful, very interesting for the entertainment area. Finally, also for education, when you think about uh, pictures, when you think about uh, something that is written on the board or a book, this is always a very much of a one-sided information exchange. You can only read. Whatever you do, whatever exercises you do, what is on the picture, what is on the movie, what is on the book does not change. That text does not change, does not react to you. When we're talking about creative coding tools for education, they can be interactive. I mean, this, this is one of the most interesting purposes for creative coding tools is to be interactive. Um, and you can uh, just be a simple user of these kind of tools, but you can also be the programmer of, this, of these tools. And then what you actually learn, if you actually learn how to program from very young ages, like what is happening right now in the UK, I believe, and maybe some other countries, is that you are kids are learning programming at the same time that they are learning another language. Because in the end, that's what it is. It's just a language with rules. Um, and it, a lot of people get scared when, when they see the, the word programming, but it's just a language. If you learn it as a kid, you're going to be great in no time. Whether, uh, well, in place of if you start learning it when you're a bit older, yeah, it can be very, very challenging as we all heard. So this kind of concludes the presentation, but now uh, on the PDF, you will have several, uh, you will be able to see several links to several different kind of programs where I said that, for example, I'm a big fan of Java. I'm also a big fan of Touch Designer and Unity. Um, and you also have some examples of audio frameworks or audio languages. And what I, what I mean by the separation is that with some of these tools, actually with processing, Unity, Touch Designer, you can also make sound, but I would say that the biggest purpose for them is to create something visual, but you can also make sounds. However, you have languages that are designed specifically to create music. And the way you, how you create a line, uh, like I said in the beginning, when you create a line, you need to know what is the starting point, what is the end point. So it's, much, it's a bit of an iterative process, uh, but when you're making music, music comes in loops. Music is repetitive. So, uh, I don't know if the chat is hanging or if the streaming is hanging, hopefully not. So when you're trying to make music, it's not the same creative process as when you make graphical visual art. So the language needs to, needs to, be, needs to adapt to these circumstances. And that's why you have a big separation between graphical frameworks and audio frameworks. Uh, let me just check if the stream is still running. I hope so. And uh, last but not least, so you still have a lot of, uh, I just gave you, uh, so here I'm just showing a few links to tutorials where the most popular one is the coding train by Daniel Schiffman. So Daniel Schiffman is one of the big, uh, uh, um, how do you say it? One of the people most responsible for the growth of creative coding over the last years. Um, I also found a very, very interesting creative coding tutorial for Unity. And when I say interesting, I mean that Unity is a game engine. So it's designed to, to design games. However, when you're creating something, an a creative coding algorithm or a creative coding project, a, being a game already limits your choices. So a game is very interactive. Actually, almost nothing happens in a game unless you move your character. So this is not what you always want. Sometimes you just want a bit of interaction and you want a lot of development from the program or from the algorithm itself. And these are two different ways to program. And that's why I found this creative coding uh, with Unity tutorial from Rick Barraza so interesting because it did, didn't teach me how to do games or to how to do a game engine in Unity. It taught me how to do scripting and how to work a bit in the same way that I, same way that as I work with processing work in the same way with Unity.
Touch Design is an awesome program. There's a lot of good tutorials. A very open community. Actually, for all of these uh, programs and all of these languages, the community, the, the software, development com software development community is one of the most open, open-minded and helpful communities that I ever met within my hobbies. And last but not least, uh, so these are some of the communities that are present in the Netherlands, some from Amsterdam, some from Eindhoven, um, that you can uh, join, uh, especially that last group is a Facebook group, Creative Coders in Eindhoven, uh, that I started in order to see if I can speed up what is happening in Eindhoven about creative coding, share new kind of things, and uh, incentive people to, to really push uh, this, uh, this art form forward. Um, but these are, uh, these are other groups that you can uh, simply join just uh, by watching or by joining the events that they organize. And that's it. Um, so, time, uh, I'll give you just a few seconds to, to write down any final uh, questions that you have. And there's a question from Govers Rick. Is program language a uh, universal language like Esperanto or there are different languages? Um, let me put it this way. Um, <coughs> uh, so a programming language is a thing. So then you have specific examples of programming languages, Java, Python, C++, these kind of things. But a programming language is not, if, if I ask you, uh, where did language come from? It, language is a thing. If I ask you, where did Esperanto come from? There's a whole story and Esperanto is a language. So you have different types of languages. You have also different types of frameworks. Uh, okay, I'm not getting into technical because this is only going to confuse you more. But there are languages, there are programs, and there are frameworks. And uh, the, the connection between, between these three becomes a lot more clear when you actually start doing it. Um, but I would advise you for a start, yeah, just to start by learning a programming language by itself. So I don't see any more questions and this was way longer than I expected. So uh, first thing I want to say really thank you a lot for the, the amount of, for the people that stayed until the end of the presentation. Uh, you can visit my website and if you have any questions you can also send me to these questions to schuf.creations at outlook.com. And yeah, I hope that you enjoyed the, this, uh, uh, sorry. I hope you enjoyed this presentation, which is basically a collection of all the knowledge that I've been organizing for myself, for me to be able to understand what creative coding is over the last two years since I started to take it a bit more serious. Um, how can you get the presentation? That is a good question from Mayra. I will upload the PDF file uh, within the next hour somewhere and I will share it on LinkedIn. Uh, well, actually, if, if everyone that is present now has access to Facebook, there will be some kind of link on Facebook where you can download the PDF. Um, I think I will not put it on LinkedIn. Well, you will get a link the same way that you got the link for this live stream. Whew. So that's almost two hours of streaming. Bye-bye, and I hope you enjoyed it.